How's everybody doing at this time that my favorite, well, one of my favorite sci-fi authors, Douglas Adams, refers to as the long, dark tea time of the soul? <laughs> Guys, that's, that's what uh, Gen Xers call Sunday scaries. You guys doing all right? All right. Wow. All right. Well, let's change vibes. Not permanently, just momentarily. In August, my mom passed away, and it was the apex of a year of sustained grief. She had a brain tumor that turned out to be double bad news. It was a metastasized uterine cancer. And over the course of a year, we lived 100% of Maslow's, no, not Maslow, the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. Right? There was a little bit of denial. There was a whole lot of anger, fair amount of bargaining, right? and gradually the depression and then the acceptance. But gradually, grief gave way to relief, and we moved to the least discussed and certainly least published six phase that nobody ever talks about. Cleaning. Gale force cleanup. Mom had a little house, but that little house was full of a lot of memories. So many memories, because mom was a collector. She wasn't a hoarder, but she was a storyteller. And nothing filled her cup more than collecting the mementos and memories of our small family's journey through this world. And mom was a widow, and I was an only, which meant that I had the burden and the blessing of going through all this stuff. Picture after picture after picture, ranging from, in this case, the, the poetic, to the profound, to the problematic. <laughs> I love my dad, but that stuff doesn't fly in 2024. Goodness gracious, dad. But like John Lennon said, right? Life's what's busy, or life's what happens when you're busy making other plans. And most of the pictures that we found were what, what you might say is prosaic which is geek speak or, or nerd word for everyday slice of life stuff. Like little me hanging out my jams, enjoying the 1982 version of screen time. <laughs> and what's this kid watching? Well, mom collected that too. Because she doesn't just have photos, she has every art project I ever did <laughs> since the moment I popped out of the womb. For example, the forensic file carbon dated suggests that this picture likely finds me watching Star Wars. Two years later, my nuanced taste had evolved to the geekery of Star Trek. And by age nine, I was all in on Transformers. Now, it wasn't enough for me to be a consumer of science fiction. I wanted to be a producer of science fiction, which was why at the ripe old age, of 10, I wrote my first book, Marty the Martian's Day in Space, which mom also collected next to all the other trinkets, curiosities, and surprises. Now, are you guys ready for today's first science fiction reading? That sounded decidedly half-hearted. <laughs> and I don't blame you, because I would not trust a 10-year-old children's author writing for fellow 10-year-olds. But here we go, Marty the Martian's Day in Space. Marty the Martian was looking for fun. He flew his dad's spaceship up to the sun. The temperature grew warmer the closer he got. Forget this place, it's much too hot. I was quite proud of myself. And to think there were nine more planets, 36 more rhymes where that came from. God help my parents, my teachers, and my siblings that I never had. Here's the thing. Fast forward. I've got the solar system figured out. Let's go interstellar. 
Let's graduate from science fiction to science fact in what might be the world's worst fifth grade science project, I decided to go ahead and prove Einstein's hypothesis that there was something called a black hole. Now, if that weren't questionable enough, you should have seen the approach also documented in Mom's Safe Science Project. This little twerp took a macrame hoop, placed a black garbage bag inside it, took a lead weight, spray painted it black so as to create a supermassive singularity. Here's where it gets good. Put marbles around the edge of the macrame hoop, put it on two chairs in the dining room, and per the Saved Science Project abstract, quote, observed the marbles' behavior daily for a month. <laughs> Mind you, we're not accounting for exogenous variables like the dog. But the punchline is this. Six marbles fell in, two marbles fell out, two remained on the rim, ergo QED, black holes most certainly exist. <laughs> Sounds like good science to me, and it did to my fifth grade teacher too, Miss Gambino, who was a musician and an arts person. She said, it's such a good story, and the science is interesting. <laughs> then I met my junior high science teacher in sixth grade, he said, are you the, uh, you the black hole kid? I said, yes, sir. He goes, between you, me, and the Heavenly Father, that shit's not going to fly in junior high. So folks, I was deeply conflicted. Oh, wrong way. Boop, 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 boop. By eighth grade, per our graduation booklet, also saved by mom, I didn't know whether or not I wanted to be an entertainer or a computer engineer. And I was facing what my team has come to learn is something called a dichotomy. A dichotomy, a division or contrast between two things that feel completely opposite, completely different. What am I going to do? I don't know, uh, a dichotomy between arts and science. Uh, 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 that wasn't the only one. I was feeling a dichotomy between respectability and rebellion. Look at that grunge guitar vibe topped off with a young Republican haircut. <laughs> this kid was mixed up from the jump. Well, all the way through college, I talked to the guidance counselor. I said, I don't know what I want to do. I love to read and write and create and tell stories. But I'm also decent enough, you know, at math and science. I had improved since the black hole affair. And my guidance counselor gave me advice that I'll never forget, and I slightly regret. He said, well, our engineers start at 40 grand a year. Our arts and letters graduates typically go to graduate school, and that costs about 40 grand a year. <laughs> and so I jumped right into engineering. And I hated it. Not because of the content, but because of the format, right? The medium is the message, and the medium was too cold. These people were asleep. They were disengaged. And so I said, are there any arts and letters careers that make money? Maybe, maybe I can be a lawyer. Uh, so I jumped into pre-law, and it was too hot. Like Goldilocks, right? It was too hot. They literally enjoyed arguing with each other for a living. And I thought, this ain't it either. And I'm looking out the window, and I see these long-haired hippies. And I think to myself, I wonder what those kids major in. Anthropology. <laughs> Which worked for me, because I was a fledgling hippie by this chapter. And there was a really cute young woman in the class with whom I shared a shocking degree of interest. Married three kids happily ever after, but that's not important right now. What's important right now is that I ended up meeting a professor who would curiously teach me more about technology and the future than anybody I would have ever found in our engineering school. His name was Professor James Bellis. May he rest in peace, passed last year. Big loss. Professor Bellis, or Jim, he insisted. 
He focused on physical anthropology and he focused on human evolution. And I'll never forget, he told us, he said, listen, technology is a puffy-chested, four-letter, four-syllable synonym for tool. And tools have been inseparable from the human condition from the jump. He said the first Homo habilis 2.7 million years ago fashioned the first sharpened stone tools as a hack to free precious human cycles for higher order pursuits. 5,000 years ago, the Sumerians recorded the first written language as a hack to free precious human cycles for still higher order pursuits, right? You don't have to remember everything all the time because we got it. Well, jump forward, the printing press, a hack to free precious human cycles for higher order pursuits. In this case, you don't have to repeat yourself all the time because we got 30 copies of it. Well, we all know where this went. Oh, can I get some volume, please? Sold. I think it might have been in Let me back that up really quick. I remember uh, reading an article when I was about 12 years old, I think it might have been in Scientific American, where they measured the efficiency of locomotion for all these species on planet Earth. Uh, how many kilocalories did they expend to get from point A to point B? And the condor one uh, came in at the top of the list, uh, surpassed everything else. And humans came in about a third of the way down the list, which was not such a great showing for a crown of creation. And, uh, but somebody there had the imagination to test the efficiency of a human riding a bicycle. Human riding a bicycle blew away the condor, all the way off the top of the list. And it, it made a really big impression on me that we humans are tool builders, and that we can fashion tools that amplify these inherent abilities that we have to spectacular magnitudes. And so for me, a computer has always been a bicycle of the mind, uh, something that, that takes us far beyond our inherent abilities. And uh, I think we're just at the early stages of this tool. Well, understatement of the century. The first computer was a hack to free precious human cycles from having to calculate. And that gave way to the World Wide Web which was a hack to save precious human cycles from having to collaborate inefficiently. Remember crowdsourcing, 2006, the idea that a sufficiently large number of amateurs properly aligned could equal or exceed the value of a singular paid expert. The end of Siskel's and Ebert's and the beginnings of Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb's. And then here we are, folks, from a bicycle for the mind, to a motorcycle for a mind, to a rocket ship for the mind, the point is the future of technology is anchored in the history of technology. And none of this stuff is a random, unprecedented revolution. It's a series of shockingly straightforward evolutions that predate Homo sapiens. Now, armed with this anthropological mojo, Fast forwarding 20 years, my team of futurists and I at Deloitte are partnering up with the World Economic Forum. The mission, paint emerging technologies in a way that businesses and governments around the world can understand them, inoculate these folks against the snake oil, against the mindless optimism, against the grumpy skepticism, separate signal from noise and get down to brass tacks. For those of you who joined my session last year, we chronicled this in great detail. We call our model a brief history of the future. The recognition that the interfaces of today, spatial computing, AR, VR headsets, that's not snake oil. It's simpler. And simple tends to win. That, that artificial intelligence and data science advances are all about getting smarter, because smarter has only ever won. And that the number crunching place underneath tends to move towards abundance because stronger always wins. And we showed this to our stakeholders at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. And we said, not only that, but we've got case stories and understandable business examples to prove every point. And our stakeholders in Switzerland were quite happy about it. 
They said, this is good because they have the case studies which makes it real. And I said, yes, I'm glad you like it. And Fritz, if you like that, you're going to love this because we're going to draw towards those end games and use that same science to project those precious few technologies that will, in fact, be worthy of your time, your talent, and your treasure. And the team, looking equally happy, they said, this is great, and will you have the case studies? I said, Fritz, this stuff literally takes place in the future. And one of the problems with that is that we, don't, we, we definitionally don't have case studies. And there was a vibe shift. <laughs> Fritz said, but the case studies make it real. Well, with a mix of inspiration and hallucination and perspiration, I said, ah, well, here's an idea. What if we took memoirs written from imagined personas in the year 2030-something, 2040-something, 2050-something, documenting their successes, struggles, even failures with these emerging not ready for prime time texts. And Fritz said, you're talking about make-believe? I said, we prefer to call it speculative fiction. He said, have you done this before? My inner voice said, it's been a while. <laughs> but my outer voice said, trust us. And our client, Ruth, wasn't having it. That's another story. My teammate, Raquel, right up here in front, brought to life augmented in virtual reality gobbledygook in the form of a story about a young woman in Southeast Asia who not only learned medicine, but was able to practice surgery halfway around the world using advanced physical robotics. After a short flash, I was in a tunnel, speeding down a water slide on an inner tube. On closer inspection, I realized it wasn't a tube at all. It was a red blood cell. I looked up with just enough time to dodge a flying platelet. Of course, I smiled. I was inside an artery. How did med students manage in a world before sims? Best guesses? Instincts? I suppose every generation looks at their predecessors with a mix of reverence and pity. How did they learn and accomplish so much with so little? My teammate Lucas wrote a story about a chief algorithms officer named Frank, and our designer gave him a man bun, which was very exciting. Your smarty pants robot ordered a 30% pay cut for the entire company, including you and me. Our quote, fair market value is apparently significantly lower than legacy HR estimates. It can do that? Even as VP of Algos, I honestly had no idea the program had that kind of agency. Now, folks, when we shared these stories, and stories like Maple, a social media influencer 30 years out, and then our client, from the World Economic Forum, wrote a story about Alex, uh, a bureaucrat managing surveillance states, the splinter net, decentralized ledger. Not only did we end up creating the most read World Economic Forum flagship report of 21, but these stories, these stories ended up being the most downloaded assets on the site that year. And what it showed us, team, and this is a big honk and takeaway, what it showed us, other than that the Swiss finally came around, and they say never let the truth get in the way of a good story, but I cannot tell this kind of lie. Folks, this was peak pandemic. This was all over Zoom. Right? But what it taught us were four critical takeaways. And I want to share these learnings with you because what we're finding is this is shaping the very fabric of the way we do futures work in emerging technology research with our clients around the world. One, stories are the original information technology. As a geek, I imagine 
the optimal communicative method wherein, let's say I want to move something from my noggin to your noggin. I might see this picture, it's pretty swell, and if I could, I would go bloop, bloop. And you would go, without having to hear anything out of my mouth, you'd go, yeah. But I hate to break it to you, the media's obsession with brain-computer interfaces notwithstanding, take it from a geek, this stuff ain't ready. And so we have to settle for what we might call a lossy application programming interface. <laughs> highly compressed and highly problematic. It's called speech. It's called language. And the sounds coming out of my mouth run through the perturbations of the air surrounding us, run through the perturbations of your ear and cortex, result in half understood signal. Now, it's worse than that, because the truth is, we're living in an age of what I call weapons of mass distraction. Right? We're sitting here, we're like half on our phone, and we're half on the Zoom, and the Teams thing with the back, and the TV's on, and oh my God, and it's all of us. which is why we have a bad time. Storytelling is the original information technology because storytelling hot wires the connection from feels to feels. This is the Agta tribe in the Philippines. These cats are remarkable because they haven't just survived, right? Survival's a hell of a feat in modern age, but they've thrived. They're doing just fine. And a big part of it, anthropologists believe, is their facility with selecting chieftains, not who are the tallest or the fastest or the strongest, the oldest, the wisest, none of this. They're the best storytellers. Because storytelling is the cultural carrier signal that brings the beacon from the elders to the youth with minimal loss and compression. Storytelling is the original hack. Now, there's a certain kind of storytelling called fiction, which excels as a means of making meaning. A really uninspired executive might say, my problem with fiction is that it's not factual. And I get it, but there's more going on here. Moving from the Philippines to the Western tradition, Aristotle created something called the Aristotelian Rhetorical Triangle. Though I'm sure he just called it the Rhetorical Triangle. And the way it works is that if you're going to communicate any story into somebody's head with maximum efficacy, you need to pull three levers, and it has to be all three. The first is logos, logic, is it smart? The second is ethos, credibility, should I trust you? But the third is pathos, feeling. Am I moved? Why does this matter? Why does this matter for business? Well, let me show you. In our report, we started our research with smarty pants smartness. There was science, there was data, it was quantitative, it was great. And the early reception felt like this. Well, we zhuzhed it up a notch. We said, well, if you recall, this ain't just a couple of schmoes here. We're talking about the World Economic Forum and Deloitte. Dun, dun, dun. Which elevated the enthusiasm to roughly this. <laughs> they don't dislike it, they just yeek. But oh my god, you put the stories in the mix. It's the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. I had a boss when I was a cook at a restaurant in New Mexico. He said, you always put the lime juice on the fajitas before you serve them to the damn table. I said, why? He said, because we don't sell the steak, we sell the sizzle. The point team is that when you're firing on all three cylinders, intellectual heft, credible source, and the fields, you are unstoppable. 
And so fiction is a means of getting to those fields of bringing sugar to that medicine that other people wouldn't otherwise take. Let me give an example. I'm in high school. It's sophomore year. I'm sitting there reading Animal Farm by George Orwell. And I remember saying to my mom, Mom, check this line out. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. My mom goes, you realize that book's not about animals, don't you? Oh, yeah, I was back to this guy, right? Two years later, mom's watching her favorite movie on television, The Wizard of Oz. She probably, in the DVD era, watched that thing three times a year. She loved it. And me, being the smart high school senior, I come in and I go, Ma, you know what I learned in school today? It's not about witches and flying monkeys at all. Baum was talking about US monetary policy and our adherence to the gold standard. And mom looks at me and she goes, don't ruin it for me. <laughs> the point, though, being that fiction has a superpower of both activating the fields and of serving as a Trojan horse for truths that are too profound or profane to hit on the nose, because there's no way some 17-year-old kid's going to get through a book about the Bolshevik Revolution. But you make it horses and pigs, and I'm all in. Now we get to science fiction. Now we get to the fun stuff. Speculative fiction is a Trojan horse for today. People wonder, they go, they go sci-fi, we got enough problems today. Why would I worry about tomorrow? Why would I focus on the frickin' future? Well, when I was a kid, I was into the spaceship side of this stuff, right? I mean, I was really into the spaceship side of this stuff. That book is called the Star Trek The Next Generation Technical Manual, which details how all the fake systems and the fake ships work. That's peak geek right there. But as I got older, I realized that Star Trek isn't about that at all. Star Trek used space as a safe space to talk about deeply important things. Star Trek had the first interracial kiss on television because it's the future and it's space and it's fine. Star Trek had the united colors of Benetton, the United Nations as the cast. We've got, we've got the, the, the Asian American gentleman, the African American lady. We've got Spock who was sort of the embodiment of AI before AI, right? And then you've got Chekhov who was a Russian but he was one of us because the Klingons are the new Russians. It was brilliant. And good speculative fiction is brilliant, right? How many times at work in a given year do we talk about Big Brother? Do we talk about surveillance and, and doublespeak? Because Orwell wasn't writing about Asia versus Eurasia and truth is lies and lies. He was talking about a pre-McCarthyism censorship autonomy freakout. Dune is a big deal right now. And I remember having that same discussion mom had with me on Animal Farm where we're sitting there, I'm watching Dune with my son, and I look over to him and I go, you realize Arrakis is the Middle East and spice is oil, right? And he goes, because you don't make a movie about that. Neuromancer, 1982, the future is already here, it's unevenly distributed. Talking about the idea of man and machine, cyborgs, corporate overreach, companies getting bigger than governments, because that was already a worry then. And then one of my favorites, Parable of the Sower, written by an African-American woman in 1993 about a future of ecological waste, environmental disaster, and the power of faith, community, right, as a means to persist and survive. Well, team, when I say science fiction, spec fiction is a Trojan horse for today, I mean it for real. I worked as a CTO at a national not-for-profit focused on early childhood education. Those are real kids who are in one of our school's real classes. And that teacher, Dr. Brenda Island Williford, I come up to her, I go, hey, I really want to bring tech into the classroom. I want to help. She says, honey, I'd love to connect these kids to the internet, but I can't take my hands or eyes off these precious babies for as much as one second. 
At that time, I had been reading a book called The Diamond Age by Neal Stephenson, one of two chief futurists I knew before I dared claim that title. The other one was Ray Kurzweil, who was just here. The Diamond Age, or a young lady's illustrated primer, talked about a supercomputer the size of a tablet that would allow a kid in the proletariat to learn at such a rate they could become a queen. So I built a 2010 version of that. Our team jerry-rigged an early generation iPad to listen to the classroom and demonstrate Wikipedia, Amazon book previews, and Google images in real time so that when the teacher wanted to grab it and show that young urban kid what a pear tree looked like, she could. And that would not have happened if not for the power of speculative fiction. Team, the fourth and final thing we learned here was that humans are front and center in all of this and critically will be more, not less important in this AI-fueled singularity is nearer future. Here's why. I had the privilege of being quoted in Forbes a couple of months ago. And they said, this nut's running around talking about people when everybody should be talking about robots. And I said, no, it's about the people. I was at our Deloitte University, which is a training campus for our executive clients, right? I got eight people standing around. They're all chief financial officers. The kind of people you'd see on, you know, talking head TV with the stock tickers under their faces. And I say, gang, this tool is called an image diffusion model. It'll show anything you want. You just have to ask it. You're literally limited only by your imagination. And these eight captains of industry were profoundly limited by their own imagination. <laughs> this one dude bro steps forward. He goes, show me a sunset. This is the actual picture, saved for posterity. It rasterizes before him. It's a profoundly ho-hum sunset. His buddy next to him goes, Jiminy, Drandy, did you ever hear garbage in, garbage out? That was a garbage request. Just as I'm despairing for the future of American finance, his chief of staff, this young woman leader, breaks into the circle. She says, can I try? I said, sure. She says, OK. She literally cracks her knuckles. I want to see potato chips versus pretzels in a fight. <laughs> we all look at her like, you're nuts. She goes, that's not all. Potato chips get nunchucks, pretzels get squirt guns. Whole flipping things on the planet Mars. <laughs> Suddenly, everybody's waiting with bated breath. The diffusion model, too. The diffusion model cranks out this masterpiece of modern art. <laughs> But here's why this matters for business. Grumpy sunset guy literally steps in. He goes, <clears throat> I do believe this is going to change the trajectory of our company. <laughs> I'm like, what? The point is, it's not just garbage in, garbage out anymore, people. It's garbage in, garbage squared. When you're dealing with exponentials, the inputs matter more, not less. Good news, that lady showed us that it can be genius in genius squared. And, and frankly, this feels like, oh god, it's that thing again. A dichotomy. Which one's true? Which is it? Well, I'm here to tell you, the future is both, and we are the heroes we're looking for. Our future is about humans to the power of these tools. When we're using little tools, sticks, right? Homo habilis, sharpened rocks. A mindful use can find your dinner. A mindless use can bump your leg. A malicious use can hurt your neighbor. You kick that up a notch to weaponry, a mindful use, well, I don't know that you get a good, good, uh, good uh, use out of weaponry. Let's say fire. Fire, okay, cook your dinner, right? Uh, or burn your neighbor's house down, or Lord, contribute to global warming. You blow it out to the jet skis, rocket ships for the mind, you find all the cliches are true. 
Arthur C. Clarke's claim that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, if we do it mindfully and with great intent. Or maliciously, Nick Bostrom will tell you, yeah, that's how you get an extinction level event. But notice that middle one. Mindlessness is malignant. Goofing off at scale is worse than noise. It's malignancy and harm. And what our team has learned is that that top line is alluring and worth our precious human cycles that have been freed by all the things. But both of those bottom two, both the mustache twisting cartoon villains in the red and the knuckleheadery that leads to unexpected outcomes in the orange, no bueno. And so we've created a series called Dichotomies that details what could go profoundly right and what could go profoundly wrong with the emerging technologies du jour. It's the World Economic Forum fiction realization, plus plus, or maybe plus minus, with a recognition that we need to chronicle the North and South frontier. And so, it's my absolute and distinct pleasure to walk our talk and invite our authors and teammates in a sort of Garrison Keller, um, Lake Wobegon uh, manner, read to you a couple stories about what could go right and what could go wrong with generative AI specifically. So let's get a little warm up applause for Abhijith Ravanutha, Sarah Mortier, Nathan Bergen, and Angela Huang as they show you up and down on Gen AI. It's Monday morning. Arthi's car drives itself with ease into a sharp loop off the highway. She drums her fingers incessantly on top of the steering wheel, a bad habit she picked up from her father. As the car parks at her office, Arthi's ears perk up to the nostalgic voice of Anderson Cooper, rendered by AI at her request. Her custom news podcast plays a snippet on the latest healthcare scandal that makes her cringe. Arthi strides into her lab and greets the tired faces of her researchers. For the past few weeks, they've been assigned to a drug development project that could ease the symptoms of dementia, and their board wants results as soon as possible. Arthi and her colleague Roger study the latest outputs of their proprietary AI, a dozen viable high-fidelity protein structures replete with percentages to indicate likelihood of side effects. Arthi guides Roger to feed a few structures into their quantum molecule simulator to forecast viability. But suddenly, she receives a call on her tablet. Ooh, Arthi's in trouble, Roger jokes. Oh, shush, she replies. A hologram of their CEO, Lars, looking distraught, appears on Arthi's tablet. He immediately shares a video with Arthi, a press release from the WHO alerting the world to a novel zoonotic virus identified in Zurich. Arthi's eyes widen. Lars, I want to. I know, that's why I called. Lars cuts her off. Shelve the current project and give me five viable vaccine options to move towards clinical testing by the end of the week. Lars cuts the call short. Roger and the other researchers stare at Arthi. Well, let's get started. Arthi gives the word and the lab springs into a frenzy, feeding the WHO's virus sequence into their AI. While the team scrambles, Arthi sits still at her desk, drumming her fingers nervously across the marble surface. More than a decade ago, her father passed away from COVID-19 before a vaccine was available. Even with only one spike protein to address, drug development took an entire year. This newest virus could have hundreds of mutating spikes. Still, with the speed at her fingertips now, she knows her team could help millions of families like hers. Arthi snaps out of her reverie and instructs an AI marketing assistant. Draft a press release about our desire to create the first vaccine. Work in details about my father's passing. Permission to generate a video using my face and voice so the audience can better connect with the message. Remembering the scandal she heard about on her morning podcast, about the marketing issues of a startup named Delivery, Arthi makes sure to send the article to Salutech's PR manager for review. Then she rejoins her team. She's eager to dive into the details. 
Now, team, let's see what can go south. Let's hear about the flip side, the concern, and keep in mind that company delivery you just heard about in Artie's story. It's Monday morning. <sighs> Only one today. He mutters to himself as he sits down with his morning coffee. Xavier, the marketing lead of AI startup delivery, is trying to cut back after dozens of alerts from his smartwatch about caffeine fueling his anxiety and insomnia. He opens a laptop for his daily download, a report generated each morning with his agenda and relevant news. Before he can begin a leisurely read, he snaps to attention as his AI assistant Kara flashes on screen. You're late to an urgent meeting with Ajay. How did I miss that? His alarm increases as he reads the article within the meeting invite. The irony of delivery, the AI that failed to deliver. Shocking patient testimonials reveal how the London-based startup perpetuated stereotypes and prejudices toward expectant mothers in the black community. The technology, which leverages generative AI to create virtual training scenarios for physicians, promise reduced costs, improved bedside manner, and more. Yet, black mothers claim that physicians trained by delivery have stereotyped them and provided inappropriate dosing for pain management. Says one mother, It's like they trained their AI on medical thinking from the 2010s. Xavier can't believe the contents of the article. Before he can even process, Kara alerts him that the company's founder, Ajay, is calling. And Xavier knows better than to make his boss wait. Ajay is yelling at his team as Xavier joins. What do you mean you can't retrain the program? Isn't that what I pay you to do? Maya, the head engineer, hesitates to find the right words for his temperament. Well, uh, you asked us to use the AI as a service to cut costs, and the bias is baked into the vendor's training data. It's going to take time. Ajay scoffs. Ugh, Xavier, please be more useful. Use Brand Boost for a marketing campaign that shows how inclusive we are. Send it up before lunch. Before Xavier can object, Ajay ends the meeting. Ajay had laid off over half the staff and increased reliance on generative AI vendors, which meant Xavier was the entire marketing department. <laughs> he rakes his hands through his hair as if to call forth some ideas out of his head. He opens Brand Boost, an AI that builds multimodal marketing campaigns. He rushes to enter various prompts to produce press releases and video ads and uploads them to beat the lunch deadline. As the afternoon passes, Xavier asks Kara to assess engagement with the posts he distributed. It's not positive, she declares. Xavier's eyes widen at the flurry of comments pointing out that the ads only include white mothers and infants, not the black mothers who've been impacted by delivery. Xavier instructs Kara. Book an urgent meeting with Ajay at the next available time slot. He looks at his coffee mug from this morning, pondering how much more caffeine he'll need to get through what looks like a horrible evening. Thank you, team. Folks, what we're finding with our clients is that five minutes of quality time putting yourself in the shoes of imagined future protagonists not only resets your commitment to do what needs to be done tomorrow, but redoubles your commitment to do the basic brass tax hygiene you need to do today. The number of executives I talk to that think they want a gen AI project that actually turned out to need a data hygiene, data management, data governance project, probably 85%. And they don't realize that unless they get in these shoes. Now, debuting for y'all here today, distinctly pumped to share with you two more short stories. These not on Gen AI, because Gen AI is interesting, but let's be honest, it's all everybody's talking about. Let's hear two stories hot off the presses by our team about the allure and the concern of spatial computing AKA AR, VR, GASP, Metaverse. The hotel room is small, just like everyone said. But she doesn't plan to stay long. It's Temi's first time in Tokyo, and she's itching to explore. 
Back home in Austin, it would be dinner time, but when she opens the shades, bright sun extends over a glimmering city, and Mount Fuji looms in the distance. Temi puts on her smart glasses to see an annotated overlay of the city's different districts, and suddenly, a personalized advertisement displayed on the wall across the street catches her eye. A historical architecture tour. Yes, perfect. She thinks. It's happening in two hours. Even better. And hosted by... No way. Maxwell Suzuki, my favorite architect. Kara, book me a spot on that tour. Temi asks her AI assistant as she watches the city's organized symphony of cars and pedestrians below. All set. 35 minutes to the starting point, including a short train ride. Kara chimes. Kitty, as she sips her morning coffee, Temi records a video clip of her view to share with her city planning team in Austin. Using an architecture app, she sets the time back 500 years and records a view of how the different neighborhoods around her have developed over the centuries. Once outside, Temi follows a street navigation projections, directing her to the train station, until a group of people staring up at a construction site catches her eye. She joins the crowd, and a prompt appears on her right lens, offering to show different project phases. She blinks twice to approve the overlay and swipes through the design renderings by raising a hand to gesture. As she looks over the final image, a survey appears. Would you prefer a restaurant or a clothing store on the first floor of this building? Temi holds her gaze to select restaurant and sees that 65% of people agree with her. The train station overwhelms her. The people, the ads, the signs crowd her vision. So Temi turns off all notifications except navigation until she boards the train. As her display begins counting down the stops to her destination, she turns notifications back on and is presented with another choice, advertisements with human models or kawaii animations that reflect Japanese pop culture. She chooses the latter and marvels at the cute cartoons projected over the dark train windows. After dawdling at the train stop, Timmy realizes she's a little late and hurries down a busy main street. She turns a corner to reach her destination and nearly runs into plastic construction barriers. Kara pipes up. I didn't realize there was a detour. I can message them that you'll be late if you'd like. Impatiently, Timmy mutes Kara and scans a block. She spots a group of uniformed students, all of whom are wearing glasses and are highlighted green, indicating they speak English. After a hurried explanation to one of the students, she wirelessly shares a drop pin of her destination and learns from one student about a pedestrian overpass. The girl maps it for her and shares the route back. Feeling nervous about making a good impression on Suzuki, Temi bows and heads off quickly. At the meeting spot, Suzuki has started his introduction in Japanese. Temi feels a sweat on her brow from running as she turns on her live language translation setting and hears a dubbing of the architect's words in his own voice. She briefly checks her screen to see all attendees have given recording consent and starts capturing her live feed of meeting Suzuki on the very first day in Tokyo. Her teammates in Austin just aren't going to believe it otherwise. So team, let's lean into our final story today and then I'll be leading us through a wrap-up. Our final story is about the concerning side of spatial technologies and assistive reality. Even if you don't love it, this is the real world, and you have to deal with it. Amari is irked to see the avatar of his sister disappear from his laptop. Maya ended the call with him after a scolding. He stares out of his dorm room window for a moment, wondering how a call to plan his birthday ended in an argument. Maya suggested an immersive gaming experience they could attend without leaving their respective states. But Amari longed for an in-person meeting with his sister to ease his loneliness. They'd been inseparable as kids, but since Maya began working in tech, all she does is hype up the digital world. In fact, she's even bought an AI partner and a robot that simulates hugs, which still confounds Amari. Amari tries to shake off his doubts as he gathers his belongings for the big day ahead. He'd won a college competition to meet with the renowned French architect Jacques Moreau, 
who was only going to be in town for a couple of days. Amari is passionate to share his ideas for redesigning underserved neighborhoods, like where he grew up in Austin, to contain more green space, walking trails, and food sources. The physical needs that cities have ended up neglecting in favor of expanding digital services. He daydreams about working with Jacques as he walks across campus until his friend Kayla calls out to him from across the road. Amari starts to cross over when, from the corner of his eye, he spots a car speeding toward him. Kayla screams. Amari hurls himself out of the way just in time. In disbelief, he watches the car speed away and he recognizes the license plate. Kayla rushes over to help Amari stand up. Someone's going to get killed by a driver wearing smart contacts. They need to bring back the physical stop sign here, Amari sighs. Was that Casey? I think so. I heard a rumor that he blocked the two of us out of his smart contacts ever since we called him out in class for being privileged. Amari's jaw drops as Kayla details other classmates who had blocked those they disagreed with. His mind whirls. How many realities is he excluded from? How could people turn him into a ghost? I have to go, Amari says, speeding off in a daze. He rushes into an office for a scheduled meeting and is greeted by a robotic assistant who leads him to a booth and directs him to wear a pair of smart glasses. As he does so, the face of Jacques Moreau slowly spreads across the wall in front of him. Hi, Amari. Pleasure to meet you. I arranged for this office so you could borrow some glasses. I know you might not be able to afford them. I thought we would meet in person. Amari responds, surprised as it, at his own curtness. He didn't expect this. Ah, uh, you see, but this is how architects work now. You'll have to get used to it. Jacques rolls his eyes as he displays and manipulates models of city plans that Amari sent in advance. But Amari is distracted by the self-view in the corner of his eyes. It makes his skin look much lighter than his usual complexion. Was that a setting forced by Jacques? As the architect begins to rattle on about the need for changes in demographics and urban centers, Amari's neck hair stand up. For the remainder of the call, as he tries to get in a word, he can't help but recall what his sister said this morning. Nothing about this world feels real. I want some love for our authors and readers in the wings. Come on out, gang. There they are. All right. Abhijit, our primary narrator. Good job, buddy. <laughs> Nathan, Sarah, Angela. Great job, team. Great job. So, team, our spatial computing issue with four other individual stories will be available in about a week's time. So if you want to be the first to receive it when it drops, there'll be three sets of two stories, so six stories on spatial computing. Our episodes on biometrics and Gen AI are already out. And we'll keep that there for you. How's that for some slide craft? So you can keep going. Team, some conclusory energy here with our five minutes or so remaining. In a world where you can't tell what's real, in a world where we've got rocket ships for the brain, we understandably think, what in the hell are we going to do? What is the purpose and the role of humanity? And I always think it's great to reach to all the traditions, and, and, and I don't know those of you who've seen this particular illuminating take, but Buddha, what makes us human? Okay, so that's, that's not it. Um, but what is? Well, what I would tell you is that our team's done some real meaty material research, discussions both quantitative and qualitative with leading researchers, with our clients, and with the world at large. And, and one of the things that we've really found is that back to the potato chip pretzel lady, Ingenuity doesn't matter less, it matters more. Ingenuity sits at the intersection 
of two uniquely human capabilities. Curiosity, asking great questions, showing up as a learner, not a knower. Wanting to know why and to do better, that's curiosity. Creativity, generativity, instantiating novelty where none existed. Thinking to ask for the potato chip thing. Do we celebrate the Wonka machine that pumps it out or the lady who thought to ask? Albert Einstein was Albert Einstein, not because he had a giant IQ. Every scientist who Albert Einstein ever worked with had a pretty giant IQ. What made him special was he thought to ask different kinds of questions, and he thought to approach those questions in different kinds of ways. It was ingenuity, not IQ. Two, empathy. This feels sort of intuitive and maybe even a little squishy, but we ask our clients when we get together, we've talked to over 5,000 people who've contributed to this word cloud, and it's a blind cloud. They don't see that empathy's the big one, and so type empathy. And almost universally, people say, it's something about empathy, something about being in someone else's shoes that makes us human. And there's something about storytelling, fiction, and spec fiction that allows us to get out of our heads and into others. Finally, initiative. This one might not seem as intuitive, but I think it's a big honking deal, and here's why. I sat down with a large language model, and I said, what's initiative? It said, well, it's, you know, the ability to light a candle without needing to be prompted by others. It's about self-starting behavior, and I thought, prompted? Are you jealous, robot? And so I went there. I said, is it fair to say that, uh, you know, we uh, carbon-based life forms kind of better at this than you, bro? To which it said, yes. I think it's fair to say that you have superior initiative compared to large language models. And for those of you who are deep technologists, this is like the silliest parlor trick ever. But for those of you who are my fellow humanist technologists, you realize that this is a real thing. Right? I was reared on movies where the robots become, quote, self-aware, and we all have a terrible time. There is nothing in the literature, though I did miss Ray's recent talk, suggesting this self-awareness, grab the switch, and Skynet moment. Right? It's more like digital Sheldon Cooper, who's really smart but mostly harmless. When you take these three things together, what I realize is it all goes back to some of my most formative memories as a kid, right? What is ingenuity, empathy, and initiative if not creating new ways to help one another without having to be asked? Folks, I'm goosebumping hard here because my mom would tell me that the first time she ever saw me cry at a movie was this. For those of you of a certain age, it needs no description. For those of you who've never seen it, none might do. But remember that quasi-artificial intelligence, that cold embodiment of logic, Dr. Spock, seeing his friends in peril, proactively, creatively, jumped into the ship chamber, radiated himself to pieces, and saved everybody's life. And in the eulogy, when I was small, watching that scene, crying my eyes out, Kirk says, of all the souls I've met in my travels, his was the most human. A few months ago, before my mom passed, I took her out for gelato every week. And because South By has their act together, I knew I had this presentation set up for like the last nine months. And I got to telling mom about it. I said, mom, we're going to be doing a talk about how fiction, and specifically speculative fiction, is a vehicle for business value creation. And she said, oh god, is this, is this is with the Wizard of Oz and the banks? <laughs> Don't ruin it for them. And I said, no, ma, it's really not about that at all. 
It's about this idea, in Kuwait though at the time it was, I said it's about this idea that ingenuity, empathy, and initiative will continue to be the keys to the castle. And it was only in the last couple weeks that I realized that in classic and imitable mom style, it had been the storytelling basics all along. And so folks, you can be a technologist and a humanist. You can be a charismatic geek. You can be a practical change maker because those aren't dichotomies. They're sides of a coin and we are the heroes we're looking for. I wanna thank my mom for modeling that, right? I love you to pieces. I wanna thank my team for modeling that every damn day. You guys are the best. And I wanna thank each and all of you who stuck around during the long dark tea time of the soul, Sunday afternoon, good God, to join this fight with us. Thank you so very much, folks, and I'm so deeply grateful for your time. Thank you. Folks, we have, to my shock and surprise, a minute and 15 seconds for questions. I thought we'd have negative 15. So does anybody have any questions? Because we're certainly here for it. Awkward. <laughs> All right, go enjoy your Sunday, folks. Have the best time. See you.